Thank you very much. I feel very spoiled. This is very royal treatment that I'm getting down here. I should come down more often. I am, in fact, the coordinator of the Master of English in a Global Context, which is a University of Melbourne uh, master, master program from the Graduate School of Education that we deliver up on the third floor. If anybody's got any questions after this, come and visit me, ask questions. You'll find me uh, on the way to the library as you come out of the lift, turn left. I am on the room just before the toilets. Sometimes I think I live in the toilets. So if you're in the toilets, you've gone too far. This, um, this lecture is bringing together aspects of our whole program. And our program is about cross-cultural communication in English and how to improve your ability to communicate cross-culturally in English. And that's consequently why it's called Don't Get Lost in Translation. And essentially it's about meaning making and how meaning is made in English these days globally. And there are, you know, I have to really edit and extrapolate from this very complex program that we deliver. And three arms of that editing that I've done is talking about English as a language globally and the characteristics it's taken on in its global context, how we make meaning in specific contexts, uh, and that specific context being culture and how a culture and perception impact on our values, and then looking at how the role of English, perhaps our perceptions and our culture might lead to cross-cultural confusions. So that's where I'm going in this um, lecture. And I'm going to start here about the role of English as an international language. Now this is a baseball team in Japan and they are very proudly called the Bastards Baseball Team. Now, for many first language English language speakers, this is a hilarious name. Does anybody know what bastards means? I'm very deaf, very loud, please. Out of married son. Excellent. A baby born out of wedlock. But language takes on additional meanings in the way it is used and where it is used and the reasons it's used for. So in Australia, bastard also has a very derogatory meaning because our society has shifted so much that the use of the word bastard to mean a child born out of wedlock it sort of isn't really relevant anymore because uh, we are a less conservative society than we once were. So now it has a number of meanings and mostly they're derogatory like you old bastard meaning you really are a nasty old person and I really don't know, you know who is going to listen to you or occasionally in Australia. It's used as a term of, of affection, but usually in the colloquial vernacular form amongst men when they're at the pub and they say, you really are an old bastard, aren't you? So for a first language English language speaker to see a Japanese baseball team appropriating the word bastard and taking it on proudly as their team name may make us snigger, laugh, giggle, but in the end, the laugh is really on the first language speaker because they're not using that name for me. They don't expect me to be reading this name. This has been used for that context, for that baseball league. They have attributed all sorts of values to that word bastard that's relevant to them in their context. So me laughing, as I do whenever I see it, is actually irrelevant. And I think that takes us on to the role of English, who speaks English, how it's used globally at the moment. And as this slide suggests, and you can't see all of the information on this slide, I know, but I think the most important thing to be aware of is that globally, English these days has a role of what we call a lingua franca, a third language that's a shared language but not the first language of any of the speakers who are interacting with it. And it seems to have become a global lingua franca because the reality of the world is, as you see with these circles up here, the biggest circle at the top of English language speakers are those, I would guess, you are 
you come from that third circle, the majority of you students, which is those who learnt English as a foreign language through school, but in whose country English doesn't really have any official role. It just seems to be recognised as having some sort of importance or need. So the largest number of English language speakers in the world come from China, one. The largest number of English language speakers do not come from first language English language countries. So every day when there are interactions in English, they're not between native speaker and native speaker, or second language, somebody whose first language is not English speakers and native speaker. They're between second language English language speakers and second language English language speakers. This is a reality, and as such, that must have an impact on English itself, how English is used, and the way it's going to go. So when English is used as an international language in this context, cross-culturally, it has several features. <coughs> It has this lingua franca role, which I refer to twice in this, so it's a common language across a number of groups. And it's not connected with an English language, a traditional English language nation, like the UK or the US or Australia. But the interesting thing about it is that often it takes on locally the identity of the culture around it, because that's what language does. We use language to construct and enact our identity. We use language to announce that we are a part of a specific social or cultural group. We use language as a force to keep us in, maybe to keep others out, or maybe to let others in. We construct social relationships through language. That's one of the functions of language. So if it's working for specific reasons within a culture, then it's taking on the values, the needs of that culture, and it will be recognizable in aspects of the language, vocabulary, grammar, pronunciation, all those sorts of things, so that individual variations will arise. And globally it's a tool, as I said, of um, cross-cultural communication. It's become a cross-cultural lingua franca. People are not necessarily learning English to learn about US culture, Australian culture or UK culture. People are not using it to speak to target uh, to sort of target first language, English language people, that means me. You're learning it in order to talk to people, perhaps in neighbouring countries, for whom English is also a lingua franca. So its function is very, very, very different in today's world. It seems to belong, it's becoming to belong to no one. I'm sorry, <laughs> it belongs to everyone and it's owned by no one. And so consequently, the corollary of that could be that there are no native speakers. So even that terminology that I'm using may be old-fashioned terminology. So let's have a little look at that, what we mean by this. When a language takes on the local identity, lots of things happen. So let's just look at, for instance, the um, vocabulary. It might blend with the number of different languages that are in the country. They might construct individual and very specific vocabulary to that context. And what we see here is some examples of vocabulary that's arisen from countries that majority of these countries were a part of the colonial phase that the UK and indeed the US had, which caused the initial spread of, uh, of English. So they have had time to really develop and expand and, and take on very specific characteristics of that country. Vocabulary, grammar, pronunciation. Check the vocabulary. Singapore. There is a word stinko. This is not, I'm not talking about fads or trends or novelties. This is a word that's used as, currently as a part of the um, linguistic experience. It's part of the ling language choices that people make. So the, ver the word stinko, anybody want to make a guess at what that might mean? Smells. Oh, close. Make it a, an adjective. Smelling. 
smelly. Well done. So, and I think that's great because it's it is what it sounds like, isn't it? Stinko, you think it's going to be smelly. Teacher S, you can see what's happened there, and of course. Um, English is so illogical, I don't know why there isn't a word teacheress. There was a word actress, there was a word, I can't even think of any other word, there's a word poetess. Why is there no teacheress? So the logic of India has taken on a teacheress, a female teacher. My very favourite is dry coffee. Anybody? I'm going, I try to use it, but nobody understands me when I say dry coffee. Any clues? <coughs> No ideas? With I think dry coffee must be coffee without water, milk or anything. Just coffee. If it's dry. But apparently not. Dry coffee is coffee without milk and sugar. So in Kenya, coffee without milk, milk and sugar is dry coffee. So when you go to Kenya and you ask for a dry coffee, remember or you're in trouble. Hi hat. Now this I found as somebody who's interested in linguistics, I find hi hat really an interesting piece of terminology. It comes from the Philippines, and as you probably know, the Philippines is uh, English came to the Philippines for the majority through uh, the United States. So their target has got a lot of borrowings from the United States language and a lot of concepts from the United States English. So I think hi-hat is really quite an interesting one because it reminds me, being my age and my background, of 1930s uh, Hollywood movies where people wore top hats and they danced in the movies. So hi-hat and top hat su suggests aristocracy because that's interesting because in fact hi-hat means snob and snob is somebody who looks down on people who don't come from the same class or the same um, educational background or whatever. People who think they're better than other people are generally called snobs, but in the Philippines they're called a high hat. This last one you're all looking at it and you're saying, for goodness sake, Sue, there's no complications with handphone. We all know what a handphone is. Yeah? Yeah. It's common language, Sue. Where's your problem? We know it's a mobile. But I, re I really, it fascinates me because about eight years ago when I first heard this word when I was teaching students in this master's program, Indonesian students, they would stand up and I would say to them, how can you possibly have created handphone out of mobile? I have a telephone at home, it's there, it's plugged into the wall, I pick it up with my hand, why is that not a handphone? <laughs> but, you know, pointless argument, it does not matter what I think or what I feel, it really doesn't matter, it's not for me, it's not my word. So have a quick look at this. Ah, this is where my problems lie. My videos aren't working. So let's just try and bring up um, the YouTube clip. And think to yourself, where are we? There we are. Have a look at Terry from Singapore and listen to this variation. Read the captions if you can, because what you will see is grammar, syntax, changing from what you might regard as a standard. Good morning, my name is Terry. T-E-R-R-Y, Terry. I'm a working class Singaporean. Every morning, I take the public transport to work. And you know what SBS stands for? Sipe slow la. You see ah, uh, 20 minutes already. Bus still not here. And when the bus comes, the people just rush for it, you know. Later you see this woman ah, uh, coming, coming. You see, ah, there this woman ah, macam dum push cannot get onto the bus at that. Stare at me some more. But wah, like really dum push cannot get onto the bus ah. So crowded, packed like sardines. Ah, <laughs> my England not bad right? Know how to say packed like sardines ah. When I went to work, I thought it will be a smooth day. But don't know why, so sway you know. Aircon break down. Wow, so hot. I sweat like pig, you know. How to work like that? <sighs> Want to work also cannot concentrate. Cannot ah. Uh, must complain ah. Uh. Finally, it was lunch time, so I went to the hawker center to have my lunch. But you will never believe what I saw. 
They shoot everywhere Here and here and everywhere But when I found a seat I quickly put down my tissue If not you know So paisay ah. But when I came back to my seat oh, I tell you today everything go wrong Somebody got my seat you know To know why today everything wrong ah. Okay, we're going to leave Terry there and I'll find my way back to the PowerPoint. Um, the point of Terry was... The point of Terry was that if you were listening to him, you could hear pronunciation differences, you could hear... Um, you could see the vocabulary differences, you could see the blending from the first language. A really nice example of the way uh, a language English is taking on the characteristics of the society around it. The interesting thing about Singlish is that simultaneously Singlish is becoming more and more popular amongst not just working class Singaporeans, but Singaporeans as a form of identification of we are Singaporean. And interestingly, at the same time, the government is trying to bring in um, legislation from the top of speak proper English. I think they've got a, fight, a, a losing battle in, to some extent because Singaporean Singa Singlish is becoming more and more popular as a way of identifying self and even theatres and plays are being produced in Singlish and that's one interesting thing about language change is once the institutions of society take the language in like theatres, like newspapers, like politicians then it gains some sort of authenticity so I think the Singapore government's got quite a battle on their hands because the key is that no language or variety is inherently superior or inferior to any other because of the language structure. It is not the language itself that constructs superiority or inferiority. It's social attitudes to the language. And those social attitudes are generally communicated or defined by those who have the socio-cultural power. So it's going to be the variation of English spoken by the, the more educated, those in power, and those probably with the economic power in a country are likely to be the ones who define which is the approved variation of a language. And I, I would bet, if you think back to your own languages, you could probably recognise that there's some element of this. No language is... Um, or variety is more primitive than any other and no and language change itself is natural it's not a signal of decline and in looking at singlish you can see how language change takes on very uh, very um, obvious characteristics for very specific reasons I had I spoke to a um, PhD student from Monash, Ooh, never mind, a PhD student from Monash doing a linguistics thesis who was looking at English as an international language and she was a Korean and she was wondering about this idea of attitudes to English. So I could tell you that no language is superior but you know that there are those social attitudes out there that are linked to very specific variations of language and specific variations of English. So she did a little bit of research at, at, at the beginning of her PhD to try and determine what the attitudes were toward English in Korea. And not surprisingly, because of Korea's history, economic, political history with the United States, what they, she discovered was that US English was regarded as the clearest and most efficient form of the English language, the most efficient variation of English language. Don't rush and write this down as a fact. This is an attitude, right? And attitudes stem from specific perspectives. And we can probably look analytically at why, where this perspective has come from in Korea. The bit that I don't get is the next bit. This is the bit that, as an Australian, completely leaves me confused. And that is that British English is sexy. <laughs> <laughs> that leaves me confused. Australian English is not actually thought about at all in Korea, so that puts me in my place. I can sit here, be confused, but nobody's thinking about my language. And so we all listen to the BBC because terrible news sounds better in a sexy British accent. <laughs> or not.
The more English you get in a country, com consequently, any country, whether it's a first language country or not, because it takes on the attributes and the characteristics of its culture, the less internationally comprehensible it becomes. So that's not just Singlish, but that's Australian, American, etc. As we take on the varieties of our language, um, yes, I'm about to use it, I'm about to find another YouTube clip to point this out to you. As we take on these different varieties, they become less comprehensible to those who don't speak. <laughs>
to my husband or to my family, I'm going down the street or up the street, it has a very specific meaning. It doesn't mean I'm just going for a walk. If I don't come back with some groceries, they'll say, well, was the shop closed? There's no mention of a shop there. So this is the confusion of characteristics. But then we also have cultural metaphors, and cultural me metaphors might be standard cultural metaphors. These are sort of UK-based, British English-based metaphors that we've inherited. And we might use them so often that we think of them as literal English. And I have been caught out with this on a number of occasions when I teach a, section, uh, a subject called pragmatics. And I will start the, uh, or in the lecture, I'll say something along the lines of pragmatics is a minefield. And all the students are going, huh? So I then spend half an hour explaining pragmatics. But because they're very polite, they sit and listen to me. And at the end, they say, no, Sue, we know what pragmatics is, but I have no idea what a minefield is. What is a minefield? Anybody? With any word in English that you can see as a compound, just break the compound down, mine and field. We know what a field is. So what's mine? It's not the possessive, it's a noun. So what is a mine? Uh, sorry? Linguist. Uh, Linguist. Linguist? Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> I am, but it's not. What is mine? Barn. Yes. And where do you find them? In the ground. In the ground. So a mine is buried just underneath the ground. If you step on it, you blow up. A mine. Now people, and as I say, I've used this expression countless times without thinking of it, because cultural metaphors are so common in our language that we don't regard them as metaphors. We regard them as literal. And I feel very ashamed because I get tripped up by this often. But then we also have all the Australian metaphors, which are even more confusing. Again, ask your teachers. This could take all afternoon if I was going to explain these. <laughs> And in Australia, we tend to abbreviate things, which makes it all even more confusing. We have ambos and regos and speedos, and it's usually an O or an IE, so we also have a Barbie as well. Your teachers, they're going to be very busy. Take all that to them. So the majority of native speakers are native speakers in a non-standard variety of British of English, which adds to all this confusion about English. And they are, they are native in a non-standard variety of English because of the environment in which they have been brought up, because of their context, because that's how we make meaning, through context. And there are many, 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 many ways through context that we make meaning, and we can't dwell on them all now, but I, there is one aspect of context that I do want to talk about. But here are all the sort of various things we have to consider in any interaction in English, in any language, because we construct meaning from the situation, who we are, the broader socio-cultural context, and what the um, event is, the purpose of the interaction. These are just some of the contextual elements that feed into our understanding of a communication. Is it any wonder we all spend a lot of our time not understanding anything? Because we have to read context as accurately as we can to make meaning and to understand a speaker's intention. And one aspect of context I thought I'd speak about because of the way, because of our context, because we're thinking about English in its cross-cultural, in its cross-cultural role, is that idea of the socio-cultural background that is impacted on our understandings, our values, and our beliefs. And one of the ways, the, the way we see the world is going to determine how we interact in the world. So in that way, culture and context really impacts on our communication patterns, skills, and, and levels of understanding. So, we, the way we behave, this is Chet and Staroster here, the way we behave is dictated by the way we perceive the world. So what we have to work out is what perception actually is. What do we mean by perception?
And perception is all about the way we process the internal and external stimuli that we are bombarded with every single day. The way we sense and understand them. The values and the attributions that we give them. And what we do is we go through a process of selection. So we select what we're going to take notice of. Then we categorize them and give them labels and then we interpret them in connection with the society that we're in. So let's look at that process more closely. So selection. Depending on our cultural background, this is going to determine, in this myriad of things, what it is we are going to select, to try and to take in, to make meaning out of. Now some of you sitting up there might not be taking in anything I'm saying because you're sitting next to a very pretty girl and you're wondering whether you're going to ask her out for a coffee afterwards. So you haven't taken in any of this because of your specific situation, perhaps because of your understanding of interactions between males and females. So you are actually sensing what's going on to the left of you rather than what's going on to the front of you. You're taking that in. So we expose ourselves or pay attention to or we retain things that not just interest us but things that may feed into our set of cultural understandings of what is important in the world what is life about I come from a different culture from my my son so when I start telling my son all about my fascinating day at work he's going yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And when his father says, did you see the cricket results? He goes, yeah, wasn't that amazing? <laughs> so, selection. We all know about it. Then we've got, whoa, then we've got categorization. Because what we then do is we organize the information that's coming into us. And we're organizing them into categories that we've already labeled. And remember, we've labeled them in our first language, our native language, with all the values and beliefs that go with those, na those labels. So it's, it's interesting, isn't it? It's an interesting sort of refracted process. So we meaningfully organize into existing characters to give order or structure. So we can look at someone and say, from our perspective, that person is tall. From our perspective, that person is rude. From our perspective, that person is pretty. And that's the way we are categorizing the stimuli that we've chosen to look at and select. And then we will interpret it according to the values and the belief systems that we work within so that we can work within a social context when we are categorizing somebody as well dressed we might then be moving on to probably well educated has a professional job oh she might be worth asking out for a cup of coffee she's probably got lots of money so it's sort of we categorize interpret all the time without any sort of really deep reflection it just happens And what we do is we attribute um, the behaviours and the beliefs to other people according to our interpretations. So if somebody is behaving what we determine as loudly, because in our culture people do not behave loudly, that person is behaving loudly, that person is a rude person, I think that person is probably some sort of social reprobate and I'm just not going to talk to them. So our behaviours are going to be determined by those attribution processes as well. And I, it's just really important when you're working in a cross-cultural situation to be really aware that people from di different cultures will perceive and interpret others' behaviours in, diff in different ways. And I'm very conscious of the time. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to skip a little video that I've got, but I, mm, you should, very, it's, very, it's a very informed, it's not a very focused video, but I, what I want you to look at it and think about is the speaker who is speaking, she is talking about something called the one story, she's a writer, because these sorts of interpretations and attributions may lead to the construction of stereotypes. Stereotypes may help in communication, but stereotypes may also hinder. So have a listen to her, a little bit of her story, which is quite interesting. I'm a storyteller, and 
I would like to tell you a few personal stories about what I like to call the danger of the single story. I grew up on a university campus in eastern Nigeria. My mother says that I started reading at the age of two, although I think four is probably close to the truth. So I was an early reader, and what I read were British and American children's books. I was also an early writer. And when I began to write at about the age of seven, stories in pencil with crayon illustrations that my poor mother was obligated to read, I wrote exactly the kinds of stories I was reading. All my characters were white and blue-eyed. They played in the snow. They ate apples. <coughs> and they talked a lot about the weather, how lovely it was that the sun had come out. <laughs> Now, this despite the fact that I lived in Nigeria, had never been outside Nigeria. We didn't have snow. We ate mangoes, and we never talked about the weather because there was no need to. My characters also drank a lot of ginger beer because the characters in the British books I read drank ginger beer. Never mind that I had no idea what ginger beer was. <laughs> and for many years afterwards, I would have a desperate desire to taste ginger beer. But that is another story. What this demonstrates, I think, is how impressionable and vulnerable we are in the face of a story, particularly as children. Because all I had read were books in which characters were foreign, I had become convinced that books, by their very nature, had to have foreigners in them and had to be about things with which I could not personally identify. Now, things changed when I discovered African books. There weren't many of them available, and they weren't quite as easy to find as the foreign books, but because of writers like Chinua Achebe and Kamara Laye, I went through a mental shift in my perception of literature. I realized that people like me, girls with skin the color of chocolate, whose kinky hair could not form ponytails, could also exist in literature. I started to write about things I recognized. Now, I loved those American and British books I read. They stirred my imagination, they opened up new worlds for me. But the unintended consequence was that I did not know that people like me could exist in literature. So what the discovery of African writers did for me was this. It saved me from having a single story of what books are. I come from a conventional middle-class Nigerian family. My father was a professor. My mother was an administrator. And so we had, as was the norm, live-in domestic help who would often come from nearby rural villages. So the year I turned eight, we got a new houseboy. His name was Fide. The only thing my mother told us about him was that his family was very poor. My mother sent yams and rice and our old clothes to his family. And when I didn't finish my dinner, my mother would say, finish your food. Don't you know people like Fide's family have nothing? So I felt enormous pity for Fide's family. Then one Saturday, we went to his village to visit, and his mother showed us a beautifully patterned basket made of dyed raffia that his brother had made. I was startled. It had not occurred to me that anybody in his family could actually make something. All I had heard about them was how poor they were, so that it had become impossible for me to see them as anything else but poor. Their poverty was my single story of them. Years later, I thought about this when I left Nigeria to go to university in the United States. I was 19. My American roommate was shocked by me. She asked where I had learned to speak English so well and was confused when I said that Nigeria happened to have English as its official language. She asked if she could listen to what she called my tribal music and was consequently very disappointed when I produced my tape of Mariah Carey. <laughs> She assumed that I did not know how to use a stove. What struck me was this. She had felt sorry for me even before she saw me. Her default position toward me as an African was a kind of patronizing, well-meaning pity. My roommate had a single story of Africa, a single story of catastrophe. In this single story, there was no possibility of Africans 
being similar to her in any way, no possibility of feelings more complex than pity, no possibility of a connection as human equals. It is I will leave it there because it's, a, it's an interesting um, speech, that one. I hope you see how that feeds in to the idea of constructions of stereotypes and how we actually interact with people as a result of these stereotypes. And these stereotypes, as in her roommate's um, situation, is not necessarily, well, it's negative, but not necessarily malicious. Uh, it's not necessarily meant for ill. Her roommate wanted to help her, but it was a detrimental to everybody's interaction and their understanding of each other. And we, this comes from the fact that we see things through our own prisms. And we, see, we regard things as we move into interactions, imagining people are responding to interactions in the same way as we are. And yet nothing could be further from the, from the truth because of those processes of perceptions, beliefs and values that we were talking about. And of course, what this leads to is this ethnocentrism where um, the, we regard nationalizing cultures uh, judge people according to their own judgments. And of course, from that comes elements of prejudice. And I think this cartoon is quite an effective one in summing up a lot of the uh, things that we've been discussing in relation to perception. Because the perceptions on both sides of this interaction are really relevant to what we've been saying. Everything covered but her eyes. What a cruel, dominated culture, says the woman in the bikini. Nothing covered but her eyes. What a cruel, male-dominated culture. So they're getting to the same um, conclusion from very differing values and beliefs, from opposing viewpoints, and yet this, the same position is not the same at all. So if there's a lesson in this, it's take a second if you think that you are being offended or if you think you are offending, take a second to just think, whoa, what happened there? Be aware, perhaps, of your own assumptions, but also of what the assumptions other people may be making of you so that you can find your way, way through it. Because the way in which people communicate is influenced by the values that they hold and the different pragmatic norms reflect different cultural values. And we know that even from um, this, this leads clearly to cross-cultural confusions and we know that even in, in relation to greetings, how confusing greetings can be. As Poltrich says, uh, specific nature of face and politeness varies from society to society and from culture to culture. Do I shake hands? Do I kiss on both cheeks? Do I kiss on three times? Which cheek do I start with? Do I bow? What do I do? And the humiliation and embarrassment, if you take that wrong step to both parties, is wasted, really. It's a waste. It, it's creating a tension where there need not be a tension. So, Let's have a little think about cross-cultural confusions. We've seen where we come from, we've seen the role of English, we're beginning to recognise we have very specific perspectives on the world. So let's think about how these cross-cultural confusions might occur. Well, students generally think the majority of cross-cultural confusions occur because my English is so bad. So let's just have a look at that for the moment. These are called pragma-linguistic failures, where it's a linguistic failure that's causing the confusion. I wonder if this one's going to work. No, it's not going to work. Um, so let's try it out here. Here's a linguistic failure for you, a pragma-linguistic failure. Das hier ist mein Sektor. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Küstenwächters. Das Gerät und das Gerät. Überlebensradar. Mayday, Mayday. Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you... Yeah, hold up. I mean, we are thinking. We are thinking. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. We are thinking. We're thinking. What are you thinking about?
Pragma-linguistic failure. Pragma-linguistic failure can be pronunciation, or it can just be grammar stresses. Think about tag questions. What a nightmare tag questions are. Honestly, who made them up? Who, who conceived of tag questions? Not bad, is it? Ah, do they mean it is bad, or do they mean it's good? And is the answer yes or no? I don't know. Not good, is it? Oh, not good, is it? Does that mean it's good or it's bad? Oh, and on it goes. Look at start writing. The nuances of start writing and all the tag questions are going to rely on who's talking to you and what the context is as much as anything else. They could be reprimanding you or they could be encouraging you. And you have to determine, not from the linguistics necessarily, although the linguistics are confusing enough, but you have to de determine the nuances by all of those contextual elements about who's talking and what the situation is. Start writing, will you? Could be encouraging. Start writing, won't you? Probably isn't encouraging. It's probably very impatient. But not necessarily. It's going to be context that's going to determine what meaning the nuances are actually carrying, what nuance the, me, the um, context is actually carrying. And then there's questions themselves, guys. Questions in English, not just tag questions, but questions. Questions almost, no, I won't say almost always, but very, 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 very often in English are not questions. There's something else. Requests, orders, suggestions, advice, reprimands. Why don't you open the window? Now, when I say to you, why don't you open the window, I don't want to hear about, well, you see, I broke my leg last week, my leg last week, and I just can't get out of the chair, and that's an awfully long way to the window, so I can't open the window. That's not what I'm asking. What my expectation with why don't you open the window is that you'll get up and open the window for me. Did you get that? Good. So if anybody asks you that, don't tell them about your broken ankle. They, they don't care. <laughs> will you hurry up? Well, yes, I will in about five minutes, but at the moment I'm just feeling like I want to go slowly. No, don't say that. Will you hurry up is somebody getting very bad temper telling you, hurry up. Read your questions. We call these indirect speech acts where the um, speech act is being presented as one thing but is actually carrying a very different function and the very different function is usually a politeness strategy and that's all very well but in, in, it inevitably will lead to confusion amongst many and this is a pretty traditional confusion amongst many that one of my Korean students presented to us. somewhere or other, um, having a coffee with somebody, the Australian saying, you don't have milk, do you? Yes, says the Korean. Yes, in brackets, in her mind, I don't have milk. Of course, the milk is bought. And this is a very common confusion, a very common confusion. And I think the Chinese student who bought in this one at customs, don't argue with customs, guys. Do not argue with immigration and customs at Melbourne Airport. They're not interested. This little argument at uh, Chinese, the Chinese student board in from customs was, do you have any liquid? No, says the Chinese student. Do you have any gel? No. You don't have cigarette lighter, do you? Yes, in brackets, I don't have a cigarette lighter. <laughs> Where is it? Where's what? Cigarette lighter. I don't have any. But you said you did. No, I didn't. So do you have any or not? I don't have a cigarette lighter. <laughs> As Chen and Starosta suggest, most miscommunication does not arise through grammar or linguistic um, confusions or mispronunciations. The way in which people communicate is influenced by the values that they hold. Just, I think that's the key. The major sources of miscommunication in intercultural communications usually lie in different patterns of interaction that might stem from values or beliefs. 
in a hierarchical society, it may not be appropriate for somebody younger to approach somebody older and say, hi, how are you going? In a more egalitarian, maybe flat, flatter, individualist society, it may be appropriate. So politeness across cultures depends very much on the interpretation of what politeness might be. So this because inter interpretation is that Australian politeness is all about concepts of personal space and independence and individualism. That's this because interpretation, not necessarily the only interpretation. But these are varying co um, concepts. To, for instance, Gal's, um, this Gal isn't Goose. Um, interpretation cited in Paltridge that in China politeness rates to, relates to the social norms and in a hierarchical society perhaps it relates to status rather than the psychological wants. It, but it doesn't matter how you feel, it's what you must do in that context, that society, in that structure. To a similar extent, um, Ide suggests that in Japan the politeness is all about maintaining some level of social harmony which is interesting too because it's a fairly structured um, hierarchical society too. So you can see here just with that idea of that basic attitude of what is polite and what isn't polite, there could be differences and both sides could be assuming they are being polite. For example in Australia refusals of offers may be considered impolite whereas in China or Japan maybe they're, they're considered polite, the opposite. So we've already got attention here just in our interpretation. Be aware, be aware. So we assess, often um, second language users will assess the social understandings through their first language, through the values and understandings of their first language and will pattern it according to their first language. And this is one of the abundantly evident things that you, you see in this building often, especially in the cafeteria, I warn you, is the ritual use of please and thank you. And how particularly amongst Chinese students, sorry I'm not picking you out, I've just observed this, that the ritual use of please and thank you often causes some tensions. Um, I won't go further with that one, but I'll just show you a, an example here in a Chinese, uh, sorry, in an Australian food court or an Australian restaurant, where the waiter comes along and says, hi, how can I help you? And the customer, and this was brought in by a Chinese male um, student of ours. Hi, I want this and this and this one. How much? $10.50, please. I want a Coke. Would you please say may I and please? Oh, okay. <laughs> Hadn't even crossed his mind that he was being impolite. And I'm wonder, wondering if, if that's ringing a bell with some of you. Because of that social relationship with the waiter, the waiter was there to serve them, there was already some implicit hierarchical structure there which determined that it was not his obligation to say please and thank you. And many Chinese students have come through our program and told us how insincere and superficial Australians are because they use please and thank you all the time when there's no real obligation attached. So think about that. Unfortunately, that's, you can explain that to the ladies of the cafeteria, but they'll still ask you to say please and thank you. Think about greetings. <coughs> and this one came specifically a French student we had just, this really annoyed him. Um, it's not so much how are you, but did you have a good weekend? And there's a very interesting uh, piece of research on this placed in a Australian workplace in which French workers were interacting with Australian workers. And one of the biggest tensions was on a Monday morning. Now on a Monday morning, as I might have done this morning, I might have gone in and said to, if I'd seen Nick, I might have said, hi Nick, how are you? Do you have a good weekend? <coughs> And Nick probably would say, yeah, not bad, went to the football or went out on Saturday night. Oh, great, walk on. No more, don't want to know any more, Nick. Don't want to know the football result, don't want to know anything. No more. That's the Australian interaction. It's what we call a fatic. 
and that's to keep those social interactions oiled. But in France, because you become, you wouldn't ask that of everybody, you'd only ask it of an intimate, and consequently when you ask it, you're actually requesting information. It's a genuine question. I want to know how your weekend was, I want to know everything about it, and I want you to tell me in great detail. So you can see, if I went in to Nick and, and said, did you have a good weekend? He said, yeah, look, on Friday night we went out, and, oh God, it was a terrible meal, and then, oh, and then, I was so drunk, and he is, oh, he was, he was, and then I went, I had such a hangover on Saturday morning, and on and on. No, Nick, I've got to work. I can't listen anymore. But if he, if he had been a French worker, he would have been extremely offended. And my French student, this was something that really riled him. He spent a lot of time telling us about this. And this was the interaction he brought in. So he goes to a shop. He could not see, he was very, very confused about shop assistants calling him love as well. That level of intimacy that we get to with our language in Australia so quickly. Hi love, how are you? Complete stranger, yeah? Um, French student. Good, thank you. Uh, how are you? Great, yeah. How's your day been so far? And the shop assistant's down here, not looking at him. Just busy, busy, busy. How's your day been so far? So he thinks, that's nice. She's interested. Great, yeah. Um, uh, good, yes, it, it was alright. Look, I'm just out of uni and I'm wandering for a little and I thought, oh, that's what she said. Good, good. And she walked off. <laughs> he was very upset about these sorts of interactions. Here you go. Here's one for the Chinese. Um, here's one for the Chinese students because compliments are as dangerous. <laughs> so I'm guessing that the majority of people know what's happened here. And it's interesting, again, a Chinese student brought this one in, and it caused a lot of discussion. This is all about back translation, I gather, and deflecting a, a, a compliment, because compliments, for all of those reasons of politeness, are things not to be accepted, but to be acknowledged, perhaps, and deflected, and I gather it's a straight back translation of what you actually say, where, where. But imagine if you're the Australian guest, and, your wife, and, and you said, your wife is beautiful, no, no, where, where, and he's going, well, on her nose, her hair, her face, they're all attractive. No, no, where, where, well, her everything. No, no, where, where. Getting a bit too intimate for the Australian guest, I'd say. So cultures have different degrees of, of different, uh, sorry, cultures have different attitudes to different aspects of um, communicative interaction. And probably one of the most difficult um, aspects of interaction is silences. And there are many different um, levels of tolerance of silence. And you might find, again, we found this with a French student who discussed this at length, that uh, French students, French and Argentinians think that constant interruption, talking over each other and talking at the same time, shows a level of interest and dynamics in a, a conversation. Whereas in Australia, we tend to allow people to finish their turn. There will be interruptions, but there seems to be that sort of respect for people to um, actually utter whatever they're going to utter and, and give somebody else a chance to respond. They, there is a feeling of discomfort when there's too much interruption. This is a generalisation. A lot of this is generalisation, I have to admit. But silence also carries other um, values in Australian English. Because although we might have less tolerance of overlapping and um, interruptions, then we also have less tolerance of silence itself. Because in Australia, <coughs> our values are carried and attributed to silence. And it's all about showing interest in the individual. So the, the um, behaviours are categorised as maybe rude or uh, Lack of uh, showing a lack of interest or, or, or whatever the context might be. 
Whereas this may not necessarily be so in a place like Japan, where silence could represent thoughtfulness, not putting oneself forward and still that maintenance of social harmony. And again, the overriding um, uh, motive for silence there might be that concept of social harmony rather than showing interest in what the individual is doing. Now, as you, this sort of gets a little bit personal now, because now we're moving into a classroom context, and we all have expectations of a classroom context, both students and teachers. We have expectations of what our responsibilities are, our behaviours are, and our relationship with the lecturer might be. And the lecturer has the same sort of understanding, goes into a lecture with the same understanding of responsibilities, behaviours, and relationships. Now, some years ago, Flower Duke pulled together this table that I think is really very interesting. And on the left, we have what might be regarded, again, we've got to be careful of putting cultures into monolithic boxes. That's something that we need to be aware of, not cultures are, di are dynamic things. But perhaps um, in more high context interaction cultures where interactions are deductive, uh, inductive, not deductive, Confucian, perhaps hierarchical societies, then maybe there's a respect for the authority of the lecturer, the lecturer should not be questioned, the students motivated by family to excel, positive value placed on effacement and silence, emphasis on group orientation to learning. Now, in the class, the mindset of a class, and this is a cultural mindset, and we have these sorts of cultural mindsets about most of our contexts, our understandings and our experiences. Low context might regard a lecturer as a valued guide or facilitator, open to challenge, the student should be motivated by desire for individual development, positive value placed on self-expression of ideas, emphasis on individual development and creativity of learning. Now you can see right there and now, this probably wasn't supposed to be a great big hint, but it could be a great big hint to some of you. If your lecturer is coming from the right-hand side and your student is coming from the left-hand side, perhaps there needs to be a level of awareness of these values and understandings in order to maintain a harmonious and productive um, relationship. But it's interesting, it's the perspectives and the um, screens that we see things through. And we're not aware, ever, not ever, often, that um, we are seeing them through these very specific perspectives. Just for a final one, I've, um, just for a final interaction to keep you entertained, and then we'll finish one more. It's this Confucian, it's, this was from a Taiwanese student who talked about the concept of going home together and she analysed it according to cultural interactions and communications and other linguistic theories. She analysed it as uh, the group taking care of each other. Unfortunately she was interacting with a young Australian male. She was a young Taiwanese girl and he was a young Australian male. Young Australian men are a culture unto themselves I think probably. Have a read of this. It's late now. This is your Taiwanese. Yeah, it is. Let's go home together. This is a Taiwanese girl. Yeah, do you prefer your place or mine? Huh? Excuse me? Which home do you want to go to? Yours or mine? I'll go to mine and you'll go back to yours. Oh, so you don't want to go home together. I want to go home with you and we can chat on our way to home. Oh, well, I see. Well, maybe, maybe you can go home first and... I should meet my friend. Okay. <laughs> now this is interesting um, because I, when I, when the Taiwanese student brought this in, I needed a lot of um, <coughs> explanation of it, and I was going, no, it can't be, can't be. And what was really interesting was a Korean male student in the class at the time said to me, yes, we have that same value in Korea, even amongst the men. And when I first came to Australia, I said to one of my Australian friends when I was in the pub. He was a good friend, which was lucky. You would recognise it was lucky when I tell you what he said. Because the Korean man said to his Australian friend, I'm going to go to the toilet now. Do you want to come with me? <laughs> and the Australian man said, don't say that in Australia. Just don't say that in Australia. Because 
as with the girl, there are sexual innuendos associated with that in very specific context. So it sounded like he was inviting him, in, him into the toilets for very specific, specific sexual activities. So it can be dangerous. In fact, it can be a minefield, really a minefield in these pragmatic interactions. So let's get to the final slide and I do apologise for running late. Cross-cultural reality, pragmatic failure and cultural clashes cannot be completely eliminated, but they can be um, minimised by multicultural education. So you need to be aware. I think that's really the key understanding, is to develop an awareness of your own assumptions. Know when you're assuming things in an interaction and question that assumption. And imagine how that assumption is impacting on how the way you're, impact in, you're communicating with people. At the same time, try to be aware that people may be in, interacting with you on, from a very specific set of assumptions. And in cross-cultural communication, I think the key is to always question for clarity in the, the perfectly polite way, but always question for um, clarity because I think interpretability and intelligibility is the most important thing in having a successful interaction. Mutual intelligibility must be the common aim, but with friendliness. And this notice, I have to tell you, I'm about to blow it up and put it on my office door because I just think it's, it's perfect. you listen to me, don't disturb here, I will call police, catch you, don't come to my bungalow house, understand, I hate you all. <laughs> and on the basis of that, thank you very much for your attention today. And if, <laughs> and if you have any questions at all, I'm happy to answer them, but in the meantime, that's who we are, and there are some references that I drew on for this um, lecture. <laughs>